Good morning. I'm reading from Rays of the One Light. Today these are Bible and Bhagavad Gita commentaries written by Swami Kriyananda and based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. This week's reading is entitled Reason versus Intuition. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. Jesus, when addressing his critics, appealed to reason and common sense. In his training of the disciples, however, he, like all great masters, <coughs> encouraged in them the development of a higher faculty, soul intuition. For it is only by intuition that spiritual perceptions are achieved. In chapter 16 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, we find Jesus drawing on the intuition of his disciples by asking them who they thought he was in reality. They immediately understood that what he wanted from them <clears throat> was a subtle answer, not some obvious reply based on his nationality, sex, and so on. Peter it was at last who understood and answered the question on its intended level, the spiritual. Thou art the Christ, he said, the son of the living God. And Jesus turned to him saying, blessed art thou Simon, son of Jonah. For not by human nature was this truth revealed to you, but by my heavenly father. And I tell you this also, Thou art Peter, which is to say, a rock. And upon this rock will I build my church, and never will the powers of darkness overwhelm it. Jesus was pleased with his disciple for relating to the question on its deepest level. Reason could not have given Peter that answer. The answer came through the faculty of soul intuition and proved him thereby to be a spiritually advanced disciple. It was his intuitive perception, that insight which cannot be shaken by tempests of reasonable doubt, that Jesus praised in referring to him as a rock. The church he referred to next was the edifice of cosmic consciousness. Any outer church institution would have to depend as in fact the Christian churches have always done, on the level of understanding of its individual leaders and members. Peter's intuitive perceptions could never have been passed on to an outward succession of prelates. <clears throat> Clarity comes by divine soul perception. Confusion results from excessive dependence on reason as the guide to understanding. As the Bhagavad Gita states, when your intellect, at present confused by the diversity of teachings in the scriptures, becomes steadfast in the ecstasy of deep meditation, then you will achieve final union with God. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. <clears throat> season. <coughs> well, we had <coughs> an unusual visitor the other day. <coughs> we came home from our morning walk, and we walked into the Babaji garden, and there was a huge peacock there. Truly, his from head to toe, he was at least this long. And I had never seen a peacock that intimately <laughs> before. And when their tail is not spread, you know, it's not full, it's, he was sitting on the ground at one point, his legs tucked under him, and this long, beautiful tail all about this wide, all clumped together. 
And you can't see any of the eyes of the peacock except, you know, the, on the feather, except a long row down his back of just individual eyes. I forget how many, I didn't count them. But it's all beautiful green feathers, but then a row of eyes down the middle. And I looked it up, naturally. And peacocks are very good luck. And they also represent the chakras. And I think it's because of that long row. So when we saw him in the garden, <clears throat> We didn't want to disturb him. So we walked around to the back and came in the back kitchen door. And I looked up, what do peacocks like to eat? <laughs> and they're omnivores. So there's a whole list of things like mice and snakes and bugs. And I didn't have any of those. <laughs> so I kept reading. And it said that they like scrambled eggs. <laughs> So I had some eggs. I scrambled them up real quick. And by that time, we, were, we had been watching through our dining room window and our um, living room window to see where he was, and he wasn't there. So I crept very quietly out the kitchen door and looked at the back. And in back of our house, there's a little bench between the next property. You know, there's a fence there, just a... Um, very small space, but he was sitting on the bench, looking like, what's for breakfast? <laughs> and I, I, so I quick scrambled up the eggs, and I went back out, and he saw me. He was sitting, he was standing on the bench. He saw me come around the corner, and I don't know, maybe at home, he has a blue lady who brings a pan or something. But it was like, oh, good, you're here. And he just hopped down and came right over. And he was within two or three feet of me. And I was talking to him, you know, saying, I hope you like scrambled eggs. <laughs> and I was sort of scraping the, the eggs out of the pan. And the screen door slammed. And he went, Bleh! and went back and stood on his little bench again. So I just sort of crept over, and I put the eggs down and told him it's OK. It was just the screen door. And he ate some of them. And I went back in the house so I wouldn't spook him any further. And then after a while, we were looking around, and he was in the front of our house, and the gazebo was in the background. And I thought, photo op. <laughs> so I moved the, we had curtains on the window, and we had furniture right here. So I was in the window with my phone, trying to get the curtains out of the way and <clears throat> lean way over so I could get a, a shot of his head that wasn't behind the bushes. And he knew I was there. There was no sound. And I don't know if they can see through windows, but um, he kept turning his head, you know, like, what is that blue lady doing in there <laughs> with her iPhone? Looks like an iPhone 10, maybe, I don't know, 9. What, he's just like looking at me. And I got a lot of great shots that way. But that intuition that he knew I was there, even though he couldn't really see me. And there was only about this much of me and the phone to even see. But animals have that instinct. They have that connection. And then as we evolve and we become human and we have free will and we can do all kinds of crazy things, it takes millions of lifetimes of going, not this, not that, neti neti. I just want that connection again. And finally, we get to this place where we 
want these teachings. We want the truth. We want that connection again. And we start listening to that still, small voice inside. Again, that animals have it already. If you've ever had a dog, you know how they can read people. And if someone is dangerous to you, they'll start they'll start warning you. The hair on the back of their backs will stand up straight. They're just like they'll get between you and the scary person. They know. They feel it. And we're trying to get back to that knowing. There's a, well, Yogananda says that intuition is the soul's power to know God. We have to have it. We have to develop it. We have to put energy into it. And it can seem daunting, like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? But Swami says that any time that we have recognized and understood a spiritual truth and it hasn't come through the senses, that is the faculty of soul intuition. So just by being here, we have in ourselves integrated and understood concepts like reincarnation. When I finally, as a young person, found out about reincarnation, it was such a relief. I was like, oh, good. That so much explains a whole lot of things. <laughs> and karma. You know, if we understand that what we put out in the world is what smacks us upside the face, <laughs> we have to not put out anger and hatred and upset and confusion and all those negative things because that's just what comes back to us. So if we make it a point to be kind, to be understanding, to be accepting and patient and loving, guess what our world looks like? And imagine if everyone knew that law of karma. If everyone thought, for my own personal survival, I should be a nice person. Let's maybe stop killing people. It's probably not a good idea. But every time that we've put our minds around the yamas and niyamas, the, the do's and don'ts, the Ten Commandments of the spiritual path, whenever we've conceptualized, oh, self-study, devotion, Austerities, that we start to understand what those things mean. That's intuition. So we're already doing it. You're already doing it by being here, you and on, on, the online folks out there, too. You've already started. And that connection just needs to get deeper and deeper. I. Uh, I had some fun yesterday looking at stories just from regular folk out there of ways that they've experienced intuition. And I came across this fascinating story that this woman told about when she was seven years old. She would often spend the night at her cousin's house. And she was an extremely sound sleeper because her family would say that a truck could drive right through their house and it wouldn't wake her up. She was a very strong sleeper. So this one night, she was over at her cousin's house. And they had bunk beds. She was on the bottom bed. The cousin was on the top bed. And after she'd been asleep for a while, in the middle of the night, she woke up. Very, very unusual for her. And she started feeling inside herself, roll over. And she said, I don't want to roll over. I'm comfortable. 
you know, she was lying on her back and she had one foot over the edge of the bed like she liked to sleep. And so she's arguing with herself, roll over. I don't want to. Just do it, okay? Just roll over. So she finally said, okay, I'm awake. I'm rolling over. And then the little voice inside again said, okay, now hug the wall. She said, all right, I'm already awake, whatever. I'll hug the wall. And the bed broke. And a metal rod had broken and went right through the middle of the bed. She was trapped, but unharmed. And her uncle had to actually cut her out. She was pressed into such a small space. And her cousin also fell and was also unharmed. So that's the beauty of intuition. And listening to it, it can save our lives and save the lives of other people. I've found countless stories of people who decided to take a different route home than usual and saved someone who was in trouble. Just over and over again, these things happen. People don't understand what intuition is. I was reading the definitions, and it's all psychobabble. You know, well, I think it's the emotions that sort of um, do something or other, and yeah, that's intuition. No clue. But people feel more than they consciously recognize. Um, one of the stories I came across was Paul McCartney had a dream. And in the dream, he heard a song. And he woke up thinking, oh, that was magic. But then he started second guessing it and thought, you know, it's very different from the other music of the Beatles. Anybody remember the Beatles? <laughs> Yay, all right. <laughs> and, he said, it's very different from the other songs. I don't know if it'll be well received. But he just pushed those self-doubts out of his mind. And the song was Yesterday. So we have to learn to trust that. Even when it seems odd. Another story was a family driving down the road. Dad was driving, kids in the back seat, mom spacing out, looking out the window. And all of a sudden, she just got this enormous feeling. And she yelled out, slow down. And right up ahead, if they hadn't, there was an accident. And they would have just all piled on into that accident. If you're interested, the internet's just full of stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so fun, because people don't quite know what it is. They don't even know how to explain it, because people think, right, yeah, a little bit crazy. But I'll just read you a couple of things that, oh, before I do, though. <clears throat> I want to explain this, this uh, Bhagavad Gita reading a little bit. When your intellect at present confused by the diversity of teachings in the scriptures becomes steadfast in the ecstasy of deep meditation, then you will achieve final union with God. The scriptures, the purpose of them is a call to action. They're trying to inspire to, to reach for the highest goal, realization. And they're giving us practical instruction in how to do that. But unless we couple reading the scriptures and studying the scriptures with inner communion, we get confused. 
So it has to be both. It has to be connection to the scriptures and connection through inner communion. If we don't, Master and Swami say, we can become confused over the simplest of teachings because all, even the simplest ones are open to misinterpretation. So it has to involve the heart. It has to come from that deep place within. So I'll just read you a couple of <clears throat> very inspiring things that I found about intuition. Now, this was uh, Jonas Salk who developed the polio vaccine and in so doing saved how many lives? And he, this was in 1955 and he said of intuition, this is a mystery. I cannot visually with my physical eyes see the forces that act upon me from within and without and yet I cannot deny their existence. If I try to deny them, I suffer. If I surrender, allowing them to act upon me, and if I work with them, I feel exhilarated, and I become filled with the joy of life. How can you say it better than that? There's nothing more fulfilling than that connection to feeling in a flow so that, well, a, f a friend was telling us the other night at Raja Yoga how she felt connected and went out to, did er to do errands and there were no lines anywhere, <laughs> just no lines. And she got home in a fraction of the time she thought she would. She was in that flow. That's what basketball players and football players get into. They get into that zone where they're just, they're part of a greater flow of energy. Nothing can be more fun. For people who have done art, I'm sure you know, you just get into this state where it's, there's no words for it. You're just in a flow of energy. It's divine. And I'll just close with one more from our dear Oprah. <laughs> I've trusted the still small voice of intuition my entire life, and the only time I've made mistakes is when I didn't listen. You cannot hear the still small voice of your intuition, what some people call God, if you allow the noise of the world to drown it out. So let us make it a point of working more with intuition. It's great when you're cooking. It's wonderful when you're gardening. All these things can just afford you an opportunity to be in the silence, to be with God, to be with spirit, and to feel that flow of intuition. It's blissful. That example of cooking reminds me of a quotation of, from the Dalai Lama who said memorably, approach love and cooking with reckless abandon. <laughs> Always appreciated that sense of reckless abandon. Just get in there and make it happen, make it work. Swamiji had a, uh, following on the theme that Nirmala was sharing about intuition and learning to trust it, Swamiji had an interesting example of that moment of questioning and it was at a point of great inspiration for him and artistic flow because he was writing and he was writing creatively but it was a very, in a sense, it was a very solemn moment because he was creating the Festival of Light. And he began with this, you know, let us lift up our hearts in a Festival of Light. The essence of this ceremony has come down to us from ancient times. I mean, he sets this very broad stage and he's 
talking about the themes of awakening and how the, the, the soul's long journey through time and space, etc. And then he comes to a fledgling bird once flew out into the world. And he was like, what? <laughs> you know, where did this bird come from? You know, it just, and, and, and the same set of thoughts. You know, they went through his mind too. It was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got this, I mean, we were in a whole different place here and now we're with a fledgling bird. And, but then he thought, no, I'm just gonna go with it. And he did. And the bird tells the story of the journey of the soul. And it's just a beautiful example of learning to go with that flow from the inside, especially when it's calm, especially when it comes from a deep place. We have the chance to shift our focus. This is, this is another aspect of intuition. And so I'll just, Nirmala focused a little bit on the Bhagavad Gita reading. I'll focus a little on the Bible reading. So Christ asks the disciples, so, he starts by asking, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're this prophet or that prophet or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then he narrows it down and one, one supposes that he turns the high beams on and, you know, gets the microscope out and he says, well, what, who do you say? And they sort of go around and around a little bit, but Peter <coughs> comes out and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and then we get this whole little dialogue with Christ responding. But it's helpful for us to remember that we are all of us playing a certain role. And it's very easy. And I imagine that it would have, would have been very easy for the disciples to see him as a person to see him as this human being who has to live a certain kind of drama. And, you know, they don't see where it's going. They don't see all the way to, you know, Calvary, to, to a cross and him getting nailed up on it. You know, they think, I mean, next week is Palm Sunday and he's going to march into Jerusalem and he's going to, you know, the whole place is going to come alive and everybody's going to think, okay, he has come, this is it, it's all going to work out really great, and then, you know, a week goes by and it's a big disaster until it isn't a disaster. But, I mean, they can't see all that ahead of time. And it's really easy to lower the gaze and just look right at the person the way we see them. And this is, I, to me, this is a fascinating example of why Swamiji paired willpower with this reading. Because it takes a certain amount of focus, a certain amount of will to choose to raise up, to raise the gaze upwards a little bit and look at what is he really here for? You know, is he really here just to turn water into wine or to walk on the water or to, you know, heal some sick person. I mean, is that all he came for? Because those people, that drama's all over with on a certain level. Even Lazarus, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, you know, Lazarus is not <laughs> still alive as far as I know, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like he, he was there to, for a purpose and to show people this is possible. With the divine flow, anything is possible within that attunement. But to raise our assessment of people is very, very helpful because everyone has that spark of the divine. Yes, in an election year, even that <laughs> political figure that most annoys you has the spark of the divine in them. And it's easy to forget that when we're caught up in all this drama and this turmoil and we, we just go, but I, but I see something that annoys me. I see something that I don't like, something that makes me really uncomfortable and miss the fact that there's a divine play going on in all of it. Will is, is a key to 
the spiritual path, and it's something that I didn't appreciate coming on to it, the, the emphasis that Yogananda gave to it. And it's one of the reasons I chose that particular Whispers reading, that we demand, we do not ask, we do not pray, we do not beg, we demand X, Y, and Z fulfillment on every level, essentially. And because it is our birthright, it's not just, well, if we're good, or well, if we, you know, if God decides to favor me, you know, if I win the spiritual lottery and pow, comes samadhi, you know, one fine day. You know, it's not, it doesn't, that's not how it works. It's, we, we attract, one of the, lovely examples that Swami gives us from his book, The Path, now, now called The New Path. He shares as a young man how he chose to go out and meet luck halfway. And he would, you know, he would take a chance. You know, he's, he wanted to go to Mexico on his summer vacation, but he didn't have a lot of money what money he had earned, he had had to earn in a creative way, again, by going out and meet, meeting luck halfway. But he thought, you know, I'm just gonna, just gonna get in this flow and I'm gonna try. And he made his way, got on the train and was traveling, struck up a conversation with some people who, you know, he had a very friendly connection with them. They invited him over to their place, which turned out to be this palatial mansion. And there, they had a, relative who was headed to Mexico City the next day. And, you know, they, decide that they decided, yeah, climb in with him. He'll put you down as a second driver, you know, <laughs> add you to his expense account. I mean, it was just like pave the way. But Swami said, when we go out and meet the, the, the life that comes to us openly, then we can learn sensitively to flow with that grace, that intuitive flow that comes. Swamiji himself practiced art in many, many different ways. He took thousands of photographs. And, you know, Nirmal was talking about photographing this peacock and, you know, how it was aware on some level. Well, that awareness of nature extends into realms that we might think are pretty out there. But people who looked at Swamiji's photos would say, it, I believe that the flowers responded to him. It's like the fact that somebody who cared that much was in their presence, they would turn just a little or they would, you know, the colors would come alive or the cloud would move away from the sun and the light would hit right at that moment and he would get this gorgeous photograph. And it's just a question of awareness and self-offering into the situation. How many times we would see someone meet Swamiji, you know, the typical, f in, our, in our interactions with him, it would happen in a shop, he would be shopping or it would happen in a restaurant and he would have a certain, you know, th there would be th this little connection established. And I tell you, we would go back in other years to places where we had been with Swamiji without him, either after he had passed or at a time when he wasn't present. And people would remember years later, they would, is Swami with you? Is he, did he come this time? Is he here? Because, just because he gave his heart into that situation, whoever he was meeting, I mean, I remember the first time that I sat with him and had a personal interview. This is about nine months into my time at Ananda Village back in the, this, by now it was early, or mid-1980. And he just looked at me. That's all he did. I mean, I walked into the room, I sat down, he was there. I mean, he probably said something pleasant like, what, hello, what can I do for you? Or something to that effect. But the main thing was he just looked at me. And I swear I thought, you know, and this was in the, what's now, what, what became a recording studio later, but it was in his office at the end of 
the building at Crystal Hermitage. This is before all the rest of it got built. It was just a dome and a little uh, adjacent building. But I swear I felt like I was going to get blasted into the Yuba River down in the canyon just, just because of the power of that gaze. And it wasn't like he was going, woo. He was just, he just looked at me. But he gave me his undivided attention. And that was something that I was not, I didn't have experience with that. People just didn't do that. You know, they're always going in a million directions at once. Well, he wasn't. He was going in one direction and somebody had come to, to see him, to meet him. Okay, let's talk. Let's meet. Let's do this. And it's powerful when we give our whole attention. And that does take will, but willingness, not uh, willpower. And just to open ourselves to that power, that grace. And that potential exists for all of us, not just the great saints and masters. You know, we read autobiography of a yogi and we can come away with lots of impressions. You know, Yogananda was this very sweet devotee and he had all these marvelous experiences with saints. Oh, isn't he lucky, et cetera, et cetera. Now, yeah, okay, on a certain level, there's validity to that. But on another level, he put out willpower. He was, you know, in the same way that some people look for the best ice cream, <laughs> he looked for saints, you know? <laughs> the best coffee, who's got the best cold pour brew. I mean, people can go off into the stratosphere of minutia around some particular thing that they get attached to or connected with. Master was looking for saints. And wherever they were, he would go and find them and try to make a connection. And part of it was he was looking for his guru, but part of it was he was just trying to have as much upliftment as possible. And, you know, in this culture, we don't, we don't get, I mean, it, even in India, you don't get exposed to saints on every street corner, but at least there's an awareness that such things do exist. Here, it's kind of like, eh, well, you know, whatever, we just kind of, you know, we're all bumping along. But we can learn to focus, and the willpower element is a key to the development of intuition, I guess, is where I'm really going with all this. And they may seem like completely different things because that intuitive flow can make us think, oh, I'm just going to go with the flow. I remember we, uh, in the construction trade, there were several aspects of building a home that we typically did not do. And one of them was plumbing. You know, we would hire a plumber. We would hire a licensed plumber who could do the plumbing for the building and get it done correctly, get past all the inspections, et cetera. Well, we had a guy who was a little flaky. I mean, he was a nice guy and he was, in his view, he was spiritual and, and we were spiritual and isn't it nice and it's all really good. He did decent plumbing, so that part worked out okay. But I remember him saying at one point, because he became aware that will and willpower were important to us. They were, in fact, rather priorities for us. And I remember him say, looked at us kind of with amazement at one point. He said, you guys always want to make it happen. I want to let it happen. <laughs> and he's like, okay, fine. Let the plumbing happen. I don't know. It doesn't seem like the pipes are all going to just jump together in the walls. I mean, you kind of have to make it happen. They don't just all leap and glue themselves together and <laughs> solder themselves together. Anyway, but, but it's possible to make it happen while letting it happen or while letting the grace flow through. And I think that was the, the key point to all of us. But anyway... Let us make it happen with joy and intuitive flow. <laughs> so we'll take an offering. We offer to thee the fruit of our labors, 
Bless this offering. May it serve to spread. Thy message of self-realization to truth-seeking souls everywhere. Om. Peace. Amen. So we're going to share uh, Swamiji's song, Emerald Isle, in honor of St. Patrick's Day today. And our particular Patrick, Chaitanya, is not here. He was not feeling well, which is a shame, because he would otherwise have sung this song for you. But I will do my best to put on the Irish a little bit for us today. Come here while I sing you of emerald hills, of valleys and meadows so fair, that all who have seen them have carried away memories in their hearts, friends, like the lilacs of May. Oh, my song is the story of the lilacs of May. My song is the story of deer on the hills, of larks that soar seeking the sun, of nightingales lifting the curtain of night as with music they bring down heaven's blessing of light oh my song is the story of god's blessing of light come join me in singing of that emerald isle of flowers that like jewels besprinkle the lea of waterfalls eager to embrace the wide sea as we with our maker united would be as we with our Maker reunited would be. Come here while I sing you of emerald hills, of valleys and meadows so fair, that all who have seen them carried away memories in their hearts friends like the lilacs of May oh my song is the story of God lilacs of May